Grace, peace, mercy be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So during the announcements, I was announcing that this year's uh, stewardship emphasis is embracing Great Commission stewardship. So what is Great Commission stewardship? Well, I'm going to let generous George tell you. Hi, my name is George. Some call me Generous George. That's only because the Holy Spirit changed my heart, and now I have a passion for giving. That characteristic was not typical of me a few years ago. Frankly, I thought very selfishly and felt that everything centered on me and my efforts. But I've experienced that you cannot outgive God. That's not all. I'm embarrassed to admit that I understood stewardship as only financial giving and helping others in need. I eventually learned that stewardship is also evangelism and fulfilling the Great Commission. One Sunday, my pastor said, let's talk about Great Commission stewardship. Just like you, I had heard about the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. The pastor presented it to us as Jesus' command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I felt good that I was catching on. Jesus is sending me. But I had never thought of it in terms of giving God's word. I had never been called to be a missionary. Jesus must have been talking to someone else, certainly not me. Then my pastor quoted John 20:21, 20, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Wow, that sounded familiar. My pastor continued, Do you know that each of the four Gospels, though they are each different in their wording, end with Jesus' indicating that we are to be sent? Furthermore, the book of Acts begins on the same note. Then came the clincher. He said, God's word is truth, and as God's steward, the truth of his saving grace is a gift that we must share with someone else. I was afraid that's where he was going. Sharing the word is for pastors, not for me. I'm a disciple, not an evangelist. But then it occurred to me that I had been regularly attending worship, Bible study, and small groups for the past 25 years. All of that must have equipped me to witness to my faith and my relationship with Christ. Plus, in that same great commission, Jesus promised to be with me always, guiding my actions and my words. I suddenly realized that we are called to build up God's kingdom, and God changes and molds us into God-pleasing stewards of his word. As the pastor challenged us in church Sunday after Sunday, Jesus' call became clearer and more compelling. He commands, not suggests, to us to spread the gospel to everyone around us and wherever we go. That's a keeper. Then my pastor stated, 1 Timothy 2 declares that God wants everyone to be saved, and he wants to use me to pass the gospel on to others. Now I knew where the Holy Spirit was leading me. Not long after that, I learned that a friend of mine and founder of Stewardship Advisors had developed this great opportunity called Embracing Great Commission Stewardship. It's a three-week discipleship process to encourage and prepare us as Christians to spread the gospel to our community and those in our world. We are God's hands, feet, and mouth to share the good news of Jesus' love and saving grace. We are His vessels to give hope and encouragement to others. I pray, really, I mean that, I am praying that the next three weeks of sermons and Bible studies will be a blessing to you and your friends. Therefore, go. Don't keep the miracle of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice for us a secret. Take time to tell it to those you are in contact with each day and throughout your life. As hard as it was for me to witness my faith to someone else the first few times, the promise of God's presence made it easier and more effective. In Christ we go. Blessings to you. I don't know if you caught that little young lady there at the end. She's the one who was doing all that drawing. Isn't she fast? 
Yeah, I think they sped it up, I think. <laughs> but she's, uh, yeah, she was the one who kind of put all that together. I thought, you know, that's really a great way to kick off today to help you understand, to help me understand, too, from God's Word what this is, this embracing great commission stewardship. I think before we can even get our, wrap our minds around that, we need to kind of understand, well, who are we, really? Do I have a calling to be a disciple? Am I like the disciples that were with Jesus? I think those are all good questions. I think one of the things we hear loud and clear from this video is that every time we hear the word stewardship, we don't have to cringe, thinking that's just another way of getting into my pocketbook again. Because stewardship is so much more, and I pray that wherever you've been hearing about stewardship, the pastors have been making this very clear, that everything that you have does not belong to you. It all belongs to God, and we are to be stewards and managers of all things. But stewardship even goes further, as we heard too in this little clip, that stewardship means even being managers of all that Christ has commanded us as disciples. Maybe we need to be convinced that we are a disciple. Maybe that's where we need to start. So, are you a disciple? Have you ever asked yourself, what makes me a disciple? Well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and if you hear His instruction and teaching and want to follow that, and you do follow that, you are a disciple of Jesus. And so today we're going to look a little bit more closely at God's Word, even the Lutheran confessions, and see what that means for us to have this calling as a disciple. So I turn to Matthew chapter 16. Here Jesus is saying, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So what does that mean? What do you think of whenever you hear these words? I know that you've probably heard these before. What does it mean to take up my cross? I know a lot of people think that whenever you take up your cross, you're taking up uh, something that, that is a burden, something that, is, that causes suffering and pain, because we think of Jesus on His cross. How many of you are left-handed? Okay. Most of you used your left hand when you raised your hand. You know, when people come up to me and they say, wow, pastor, you know, I didn't know you were left-handed. I usually say, yeah, that's the cross I bear. O only lefties really understand that in a right-dominant world, right? Sometimes people ask my wife, you know, uh, about me, and she goes, yeah, that's the cross I bear. No. <laughs> So is that what Jesus is really talking about here, bearing these kinds of crosses? We're going to take a closer look now at His Word and see what He says. First and foremost, you know, Jesus said this. He was actually telling His disciples in the context of this verse that they should be prepared to lay down their physical lives for the sake of telling people about this gospel, the saving gospel of Jesus. He goes on to say this in the next couple of verses, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? What good is it going to do if you're trying to save your temporal life and throw your eternal life out the window? This meaning of this verse probably sounds a bit foreign to us, doesn't it? I mean, we don't have anybody that's going to threaten our lives, nobody that's going to throw us in jail or flog us or kill us because we believe in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's un unthinkable, isn't it, where we live here? Until you start going around the world, it becomes a reality where people are suffering and being tortured, being thrown in jail isolated, and even killed. So the reality is still there even for us today, even though we might not see it. But that was what Jesus was talking to them about. I mean, who would, who would choose a temporary life over an eternal life? You know, every time that we come up here or somebody comes up here to confirm their faith, every one of us have done it somewhere that have become members of this church. 
Either you've done it on New Member Sunday or during confirmation. You've come up here and you've had a series of questions asked of you. One of them goes like this. It says, do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Do you remember how you answered that? I do. By the grace of God. (laughs) That's the second part. Because it's only by the grace of God through faith that we can even begin to answer that question with any confidence. And Jesus makes a promise about how we will be treated as his disciples. You ever seen what Jesus says, right? That you will be persecuted on account of me. That you will suffer because of my name. He says this on other occasions. He never promises that it's going to be easy to be a Christian. Those that are suffering around the world, we are called upon by Paul to share in their burden. And the best way that we can do that is what? Is pray for them. To pray for them that God would continue to help sustain them and keep the faith no matter what they face. Did you ever notice how Jesus uses these kinds of words? He says, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, sounds like Jesus is always taking the lead, doesn't it? Because he is. He would not ask us to do something that he would not do or hasn't done already for us. He's never going to be behind us saying, hey, I got your back. (laughs) He's out in the lead. He's being an example of what it means to follow at all cost. Because he's already suffered for us. He's already died for us for forgiveness of sins on a cross for our sake. And Christ is also gone through resurrection for us as well. Of course, that's what we look forward to, right? He's gone through resurrection to show that he's conquered sin, death, and the devil. And he wants us to follow him someday through resurrection. And then even in his ascension, we will follow to be lifted up to live with him in eternity forever. Before he asks us to take up our cross for his sake, he has already taken up his cross for ours. There is an understanding about taking up our cross that is beyond this willingness to die for the faith. And it's simply this, living our lives as Christ's disciples, as people who really want to follow Him. Taking up our cross means lifting high Christ's cross in everything that we say and in everything that we do, whether it be in our families, our workplaces, our clubs, our organizations, wherever you happen to live your life day in and day out. Let me ask you this. Do you see everything that's God-pleasing that comes off your lips and everything that you do that's God-pleasing? Do you see that as holy and sacred? Who created you to do those things? Who gave you new life in Christ to serve in a way that serves others and serves God? You have been set apart as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Set apart means holy. For the task of continually living our lives for the sake of Christ Jesus and all that he has done for us. Some of us probably go to work on a Monday thinking, oh, boy, I wish it was Friday already. We think of our mundane and our routine work every day. We don't even think about the bigger picture that, you know, we're disciples of Christ. We're living out the vocations through the talents and gifts that he has given us to live this life so that we reflect all the goodness that he has given to us in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought in those terms as you're living life from day to day? Whoever we are, whoever we work with, whoever we serve, we have been commissioned as disciples to take up our cross and to share all that God has given to us with others for the sake of another who went to the cross 
for us. Whenever you serve in any task that you've been called to do, whether that be to um, serve in a restaurant, to be a manager, work in IT, to be a parent at home, raising children, picking up after them, picking up after yourself. It's all part of vocations that God has called us to do. Parent, brother, sister, neighbor, worker. God sees each and every vocation that He has given us as equally important. For that's what you were called to do. You see, everything that we are at and doing in this world is all through God. It's given to us by God. Through the tasks that we accomplish are all done because of God's graciousness. When we serve each other in this way, and we do so in a way that glorifies God and points to Christ, we are in a very real way taking up our cross or as Jesus puts it in another time laying down our lives for the sake of Christ and we're carrying that cross into the world so the world might embrace all that we are bringing them as disciples of Jesus in the good news of the salvation that's ours in Christ Do you hear what Jesus is talking about? And I'm hoping that you can see it. I pray that you will live your life as though it is a calling. As a Christian called through the waters of baptism and through faith, that you will live your life knowing that it's holy and sacred. Everything that comes out of your mouth, everything that you do, every tiny act, every conversation, you are serving the Lord. You remember where it says that in the Bible, right? Colossians chapter 3. Listen very closely to what it says here. Whatever you do, (laughs) that's pretty sweeping, isn't it? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever you do, this is not just a church thing, it's not just a Sunday only thing, it's all the big things, it's the little things, it's everything that we say, everything that we do that matters to God. These things are holy and sacred when they lift high the cross of Jesus. And I really, really want you to know this, I truly want you to know and embrace this in your hearts. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Every year we install, we dedicate, we rededicate um, certain groups within our congregation. You know, like the executive board or the Sunday school teachers or the uh, early childhood uh, teachers. And and we ask God to bless them and, and really, in a sense, consecrate their work. Well, it's true of any vocation. And so on the basis of Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to actually have a service of consecration right here, right now. So I'm going to have you stand up, and we're going to have a small service of consecration on the basis of the Word of God in Colossians chapter 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Since then we have been raised with Christ, we are called to set our hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. By God's grace, we will set our minds on things above and not on earthly things. For we died and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we will clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
we will bear with each other and forgive one another just as the Lord forgave us. And over all these virtues, we will strive to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Through the faith God has given us in whatever we do, in word or in deed, we will do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. People of God, I now consecrate you, set you apart for service to God in everything that you do. God calls upon each of us in all that we do to work it, at it with all our hearts as working for Him. It is truly the Lord Christ we are serving. I consecrate you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, remembering all of what God has given us in His gifts in baptism and how we have been called to be disciples of Christ. Let us pray together. Dear God, work through us so that we carry the cross of Jesus Christ boldly in all we say, in all we do, in every way we serve in this world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as we continue together to embrace our calling as His disciples. Amen.